this should be the last video for this talk. I wanted to talk about a prototype, uh, essentially a toy model, but it's, it's still pretty darn deep, of the strategy that I talked about at the end of the last part uh, that leads to the Birch and Swinerton Dyer conjecture. Um, and that's the Riemann zeta function. And the goal here is we're going to try and prove there's an infinite number of primes. Oh, and this is going to overlap. This is going to be a shorter version of stuff that I, it's in my Riemann hypothesis talk. Um, so you can go to there for more context and maybe a, a little bit of a slower version. So the goal is that to prove that there's an infinite number of primes. There's certainly easier proofs than the one I'm going to provide, but um, it's a very particular goal, a uh, simple goal, and it's going to be it's going to show the very um, basic outlines, the key outlines of what happens in much more complicated cases like a elliptic curve case. So here's what we do. What we do is we work with infinite sums. And that already is getting basically to the central idea of calculus, of making sense of an infinite sum of a bunch of numbers. It's really a limit of a bunch of finite sums as we let the number of things that we're summing go off to infinity. So limits uh, are the central idea of calculus. So one of the key facts is that I add up 1 plus a half plus a fourth plus an eighth, and I keep going. That actually gives you a finite number. In fact, it's equal to 2. Uh, a related fact is that when I take 1 plus a third plus 1 over 3 squared, in other words 9, plus 1 over 3 cubed, that actually has a finite sum. It turns out to be 3 halves. It, the, the master formula is 1 over 1 minus 1 third, where the 1 third is, is appearing here. And in fact, I can do that for all primes. 1 plus 1 over p plus 1 over p squared plus 1 over p cubed. turns out there's a master shortcut formula to sum up this entire infinite sum. It does make sense. The answer is finite, and it even has a nice formula. It's just 1 over 1 minus this number, 1 over 1 minus 1 over p. And if you want to see more careful proofs of that, there's many. Just search geometric series on the web or look at my rebound hypothesis talk. So here's what we can do with that. We can do something even cooler than adding up an infinite sum of terms. We can take, up those, take those infinite sums, and there's one for each prime. And then let's see. We don't know how many primes there are yet. We're trying to prove there are infinitely many primes. Um, but we're going to multiply them all together for all the primes, even if there's infinitely many or finitely many. And that's, again, essentially a calculus kind of notion. And what do we get? It turns out we get a very simple sum. Well, we get 1 from 1 times 1 times 1 times 1 times 1. Okay. We also get 1 half from 1 half times 1 times 1 times 1 times 1 times 1. So we're going to get 1 half. We get a third from one third times one times one, just choosing one third here and choosing one in all the other uh, factors. We get a fourth as well, because there it is, one fourth times dot 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 dot. Well, we also get things like a sixth from one half times one third times one to one 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 one. We get one thirtieth from one half times one third times a fifth times one 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 one. Turns out that because each number, each natural number, has a unique way to factorize it as a product of some number of twos, some number of threes, some number of fives, some number of each prime, you get exactly all of the reciprocals of all the integers exactly once. Now, this is a very famous sum, 1 plus a half plus a third plus a fourth. You might have gotten the idea, if you hadn't seen infinite sums before, that maybe any time I take 1 plus something small plus something smaller plus something smaller and I add them up, that can actually be, be made to make sense as a finite number. Not if these numbers don't go to zero fast enough. And this is the classic example. This is called a harmonic series. This one, it's actually fairly simple to show that this actually diverges, is the technical term. The sum actually is infinite. And that's, again, in the Riemann hypothesis talk. I go through a little bit more of the proof of that. Um, well, what does that mean? It's a, we didn't know how many of these there were. This is a finite number. It's just two. This was three halves. This is, is a finite number as well. If there were finitely many primes, then I would just be a fine, this would be a finite product of a finite number of numbers. It couldn't possibly be infinity. So in fact, there must be infinitely many primes. Now, you might have worried about how many times I'm throwing around infinity and infinite sums and infinite products and things and wonder, if, is this all really well defined? Well, you can make it a little more rigorous if you do the following thing to kind of sneak up on stuff. What you do is you define, oh, I forgot to make this a zeta. This should be really a zeta of s. But zeta is just a, a Greek z, so we just call it z of s. The zeta function of s 
what we do is we, instead of using just two and three and five, all the primes, we raise them all to something. It gives us a lot more. It lets us sneak up on this infinity. Because it's nice to figure out if something's blowing up to infinity, exactly how does it do that? Um, so if we just raise all these to the s power, it turns out to be the same as if we just take the sum of 1 plus 1 over 2 to the s, 1 over 3 to the s, 1 over 4 to the s, etc. Um, and so this is a very calculus kind of notion of instead of getting it doing a numerical calculation one time, we make something into a function, and we start analyzing how it depends on this function s. And you get a lot out of that when you think about the Riemann hypothesis, definitely. We're not going to go th that far in this thing. So here's the zeta of s again. And um, what we're really saying, a better way to say the statement about the, uh, the blow-up for this that proved the infinitude of primes, is that as s gets closer and closer to 1, um, that means that's what this means, the limit as s goes to 1 of this expression, that gets bigger and bigger and bigger without bound, as big as you could possibly imagine. In other words, the, the way to summarize that is the limit of zeta of s is equal to infinity as s goes to 1. Well, to make it a little bit more parallel to the, uh, the statement about Birch and Swinnerton Dyer, we could consider 1 over zeta of s. And the statement is the limit of that as s goes to 1 is equal to 0. If, I get, if these numbers are getting super, super big, that means these numbers are getting super, super small. And any time you take 1 over something and you see that that's going to 0, well, that must mean that this denominator is getting very, very big. So here's a funky fact, a number theoretic fact, and in fact, I, I have a counting problem. How many primes are there? And I want to show there's an, infin in, an infinity of them, that the, the answer is infinity. It's equivalent, it turns out, to this function, 1 over zeta, going to 0 at s equals 1. Well, the Birch and Swinnerton Dyer is a very, very similar statement. They say, let me flip back a little bit, they say construct this thing called the L function, which is constructed in a very similar way to what we did with the zeta function. There I did a, a finite s a calculation for each prime. That was the 1 plus 1 half plus 1 fourth plus 1 eighth. Here we do a much more complicated thing, but again, for each prime, and it's a finite count. We do it for all primes, and we combine into one function now called the L function, which is essentially a generalization of the zeta function. So it's really very, very parallel. The Riemann zeta function is absolutely the, the, the prototype of this thing. So instead of doing these very well-known numbers for each prime and combining them and getting infinity, we do a much more complicated count in the elliptic curve case for each prime, combine them, and then analyze. And once again, with the, zeta, the L function idea, you put in a variable s to be able to kind of move around, sneak up on stuff, get a, a much more complete idea of what's going on. So it turns out that the Birch and Swinnerton Dyer conjecture is, is very similar to this. It says that this kind of process should give the same kind of answer, that you can get the answer to an interesting counting problem. Instead of counting primes, it's counting um, essentially how many um, rational solutions, rational points on an elliptic curve there are. Um, and that's going to have something to do with what happens to a certain function when you sneak up towards s equals 1, and you take limits as s goes to 1. So back to congruent numbers to, to summarize this. We wanted an effective algorithm to determine if some given n is a congruent number. And if you assume Birch and Swinnerton Dyer, it turns out you can get such a thing. Now I've kind of given, uh, even though I've given you a very, very quick and uh, light touch on this problem, I've basically told you half the story. We've gotten t from a basic geometry and number theory problem, translated to elliptic curves, and then I've told you a little bit about how that might have to do with some calculus of some function called the L function. What I haven't told you is the other half of the story, which is all one, these wonderful properties that the L function has and what exactly that calculus involves. There's a whole huge story there that involves what's called, what are called modular forms. Um, and I'm not going to say anything about it, uh, except maybe a little tiny bit more. Um, but Tunnel, in 1983, using a lot of very, very hard work by a lot of other people about modular forms and assuming this connection exists between the counting problem we're interested in and calculus, the calculus of modular forms, he got this very interesting result. I'm going to give you the version if n is an odd number, the even is just extremely similar. It's very similar in uh, 
um, it's exactly the same in, in spirit, just the numbers are different. Here's what you do. You consider a very different number theory problem. Well, it looks somewhat similar, actually, but it, it's, it's different in a very important way. You first calculate the number of solutions to n, that's our given number, like 157 or whatever, equals 2x squared plus y squared plus 32z squared. And that's integer solutions, x triples of numbers x, y, and z. And then you look at a slight variation of that uh, counting problem. You say, given the same n, how many triples of integers x, y, and z are there to solve this problem? n is 2x squared plus y squared plus 8z squared. And then you compare the number of solutions. It's not the n or the x, y, and z you're comparing. It's the number of solutions. We're calling this a and we're calling this b. And it turns out that n is supposed to be congruent. This is assuming Birch and Swinnerton and is correct. Exactly when double this number of solutions is equal to this number of solutions. So you might be a little suspicious at this point. You might say, hey, this looks kind of similar to the original problem. That had like x squareds and y squareds and z squareds and it had an n. How is this different? Well, look at what this problem says. Suppose n is 157. If I wanted to figure out and do this counting problem, how many x, y's, and z's satisfy this equation, x, y, and z can't be very big. They certainly can't be anywhere near 157. They could probably be at most, um, you know, like about 10. So there's a finite number of solutions. It's easy to count this. For any given n, it's very easy to figure out, like with a very simple computer program or maybe do it by hand, how many of solutions there are and what, what the number a is, and similarly what the number b is. So this is a, a, because this is subtly different, even though it involves n's and squares and summing and things like that, it's different enough so that it's, these are finite accounts. It's an effective algorithm. And so this would tell you exactly when n is congruent. So this is one of the many reasons we'd like to know if the Birch and Swinnerton Dyer conjecture is correct. This, the full strength of this statement can't be achieved unless you really know Birch and Swinnerton Dyer, because that was this connection between some funky calculus, which turns out to give these things, and that's the part I'm not talking about. This comes from analyzing modular forms very carefully, and that and that's supposed to connect to um, counting rational points on the elliptic curve, and so that's supposed to be the connection. I will say one more thing about the, that word modular, though. To close up, I, I advertise this as beyond Fermat's last theorem, sort of BSD as the, the successor to Fermat's last theorem. Well, what is the relationship? I've shown you some, some little bit of relationships. I mentioned that the Fermat for n equals 4, for example, had to do with the fact that uh, 1 is not a congruent number. But there is a deeper connection. Um, uh, back in the 80s, Fry showed that if you create this curve, uh, suppose you had a solution to Fermat's last theorem. That's, that's the logic of it. Suppose you had a solution, which the point is we're trying to show that's impossible. If n is greater than 2, you can't have integers a, b, and c that solve this equation. Suppose you had a solution to that. Then it turns out, then you can always create this curve. y squared equals x times the quantity x minus a to the n times the quantity x plus b to the n. That's y squared equals a cubic. You have x times x times x and some other stuff when you multiply it out. It's only slightly more complicated than um, the kind of elliptic curve we were talking about in the congruent number problem. So this is called the Fry curve. You would generate from a hypothetical solution to Fermat. He showed that such a curve would not be modular. It would fail to have a relationship to modular forms. Again, these kind of funky calculus things that I'm not going to talk about. Um, it would fail to have a connection that everybody thought that elliptic curves should have. So that's very similar to what Tunnell is doing um, in his analysis. He's using these modular forms. Well, in the 90s, Andrew Wiles and Richard Taylor showed uh, that every elliptic curve is modular. And in fact, a few other people to nail down all the cases through, through the 90s, a few different versions of this. It's called the modularity theorem. And so every elliptic curve, defined over the rationals, actually, to be technical, um, has this property of being modular. It has this intimate connection to modular forms. And so that showed, that's how they proved Fermat's last theorem. You couldn't have such a solution because if you created the Fry, Fry curve from it, it would not be modular, but we know that all elliptic curves over the rationals are, mod are modular. So that modularity theorem effect has affected all the recent, all the subsequent history of elliptic curves. And so a lot more is now known about elliptic curves because we know they have this super tight connection to these things called modular forms. But it still hasn't been able to prove the Birch and Swinnerton Dirac conjecture. But it's placed it in a, a better context, definitely. So indeed, there is a real tight relationship to Fermat's last theorem. So BSD does deserve to be thought of as um, 
in a sense, the successor to that theorem. And that's it.